The voices of the Afro-Cuban community have never been louder. Since the beginning of the San Isidro movement that fueled massive protests on the island you saw back in July, Afro-Cubans are sharing their realities. Many here in South Florida recall what it was like coming to the U.S. and confronting the hardships of being Cuban and black. This is the first place that I lived when I arrived from Cuba. It brings back memories. Ricardo Gonzalez Sayas was 13 years old when he arrived in the United States as part of Operation Pedro Pan, or Peter Pan. There were 14,000 children that left with the visa waiver. From 1960 to 1962, it is what it is. Pedro Pan was the largest documented exodus of minor refugees in the Western Hemisphere. Just uh, places where they can put them. Ricardo's parents, like thousands of others in Cuba, feared for their children's lives under the communist rule of revolutionary Fidel Castro. What I've always wondered about was what made my parents send me. Ricardo says he was among a very small number of black children in the operation because as at the time, Castro had promised blacks equality in Cuba. Prior to Castro's takeover, black civil rights groups had made significant progress. He takes credit for all this progress made by black Cubans, and in 1962 declared racism over in Cuba, and then disbanded these black civil rights movements. John Suarez, the executive director of Center for a Free Cuba, says this is the reason why black Cubans did not flee the island in the numbers white Cubans did. This quote about no blacks, no dogs, no Cubans, reminds me that and fear of how they would be treated in the United States. No blacks, no dogs, no Cubans posted in an apartment building and I felt fortunate that I was not a dog or else I would have completed that despised trifecta. Ricardo wrote those words in his book Black Pedro Pan recalling what it was like for the black Cubans in South Florida. The few that left usually ended up in New York City because Miami was then the Jim Crow South. Fast forward to 2021, historical protests that erupted on the island, sparked by Afro-Cubans. I identify as uh, Afro-Cuban American. Even living in Miami, yeah. the city with the largest concentrated number of Cubans. So many layers to our small little country. Mari Carmen Hernandez has struggled with her identity. If I've ever been discriminated, I was like, well, I get discriminated every day three times, being black, being a woman, and being Hispanic, or being Cuban. And being Cuban and black is no easier in Cuba. According to an international advocacy organization called Minority Rights Group, quote, limited statistics available suggest that Afro-Cubans live in the most neglected parts of Cuba's urban areas, especially in Havana. Of the country's large prison population, the majority are estimated to be Afro-Cubans, end quote. We try to uplift the folks that are over in Cuba, the Afro-Cubans, because they are the ones that can tell their story. Ronnie Bennett, executive director for South Florida People of Color, says the protests in Cuba started a conversation about learning the truth. Afro-Cubans have primarily represented the dissident movement in Cuba for the last 20 years. Individuals, especially black Cubans, are being targeted by that regime because the regime's view is you're supposed to be grateful because we ended racism in 1959. So if you have anything to complain about, they punish you doubly. Yeah. Ricardo says he doesn't know the Cuba of today. I don't really understand how you can live in a system where you can't speak your mind. But seeing Cubans rise against the regime it makes me feel hopeful. He's grateful every day. His parents' despair led them to make the best decision they ever could for him. I wouldn't change my life in any way. Michelle Quesada, WPTV News Channel 5.